Consider, if you will, the egg and how it's good to eat. Whether sunny side or scrambled, it surely is a treat. Hard boiled, it will keep it from making such a mess. And everybody knows you can't return it to the nest. Consider, if you will, the egg and its astounding age. Only three weeks from creation, it begins the chicken stage. First, it must escape the plate and other gruesome, deadly fate. But victory is very sweet to eggs which have no hands or feet. Consider, if you will, the egg and how it's like a seed with all that gooey mess inside becoming a new breed. The yolk and the white together forming fuzzy little chicks so kids the world over can rejoice and get their kicks. But only if the rooster has equipped the egg for life, otherwise the egg is only fit for fork and knife. Consider, if you will, the egg in all its rounded glory. But if the egg is on your face, well, that's quite another story. It's a poem from a gentleman over in Arkansas by the name of Bob Smith. I'd like for you to consider maybe your own mind uh, and how it also maybe is like an egg. It's resilient. It's amazing. It's an amazing creation, but yet it's not indestructible, is it? Our minds, whether young or old, needs change and growth because it's very impressionable. Our minds are very impressionable. The egg has foes that seek to break it, fry it, scramble it, boil it, even rot it. Your mind, though, also has adversaries. Imagine um, mental um, battles raging on inside your head, things that you're trying to control, things you're trying to avoid. Each of your mind's enemies wants to control the body, wants to deceive yourself, wants to corrupt it, wants to pollute it. Let's go over to the book of 1 Peter. From the book of 1 Peter, we see some pretty spectacular imagery. We have the book of Hebrews, then James, then 1 Peter. In chapter 5 here, 1 Peter in verse Eight, we're told for us ourselves, we should be mindful of certain things, and then it gives us sort of the why. It says, hey, be, be careful here, and then it tells us why we should be careful. Peter writes here in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he begins off by saying, be sober. Uh, the, the word sober here has a sort of a hint toward um, toward drunkenness, toward the use of alcohol, but it's not just simply abstaining from alcohol. The the word that's used here means to to avoid uh, abuse of it that that would lead all the way to intoxication, right? So it's it's this inability to have self-restraint, right? So so be sober, right? Control that which you have Uh, knowledge to control. Exercise self-restraint is what the word here means. Be sober. Be vigilant. The Greek word means to literally uh, to watch. Uh, It means to have a a mindfulness of threatening dangers, right? So you're sort of aware of what's going on around you. Uh, Nothing is surprising to you. You're aware of it. You're watchful. You're aware of the threats you're monitoring them, you're keeping them at a distance. There's a, an alertness of mind. Um, but the word vigilance here also means that you're avoiding uh, drowsiness, right? So you have this, this active alertness toward these, these outside dangers that, that, that are lurking, you might say. Be sober, be vigilant, and then here's the why. It's not just be sober, be vigilant because it's a nice thing to do, right? Be sober, be vigilant because it's good for your character, right? Peter follows up immediately with the why. Because your adversary, this particular word here in the Greek is specifically applied to the devil, right? The the adversary of man, 
the accuser of the brethren. It, it literally means one who lies in opposition, right? So he's, he's there, he's waiting to pounce, right? He's looking for those opportunities because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. The word lion here literally means lion, right? This is literally, in the Greek, an animal that is a lion, a, a large cat, Notice, seeking whom he may devour. Devour means to literally consume by eating. To consume by eating. So we're told to be vigilant, to be sober, to be on alert, to be watchful and mindful of these threats around us because those threats, you know, with Satan behind this influence is looking not just to bat us, right? Not just to sort of kick us off the stand, but to consume us. Um, having been to uh, East Africa and now South Central Africa, we have sometimes the occasion to go out and see some of these wild animals. Um, the hunting cheetah that's, that's crouched, uh, that's stalking, shoulders are popping up as it slowly makes its way toward some identified herd that it would like to run after. Uh, it seems to be very patient, right? And then all of a sudden, it's, it's up and it's off. And it's looking for that dinner. An egg wouldn't stand a chance, would it, against something like this, against a wild cat. And neither would we against Satan without God's involvement, without his blessings, without his protection, without him helping us and giving us strength and helping us to be on alert. You and I are very much in this world. And yet, God also curiously commands us to be separate. And this is sort of the, the, the perceived dichotomy that sometimes we have. Right? You're in the world, but yet be separate. Do you ever find that task challenging? Do you ever find that task difficult? Uh, it might be easier maybe for some, might be more difficult for some, depending on our life station. And if we're at a school or university or we're at a job or something where we're literally mixing and mingling with the church or with the world, sorry, because of our responsibilities. But do you find these, these things challenging to, to, to be a part of God's way of life living in the world, but yet also trying to be separate. The environment we live in is sickening, isn't it? The politics of the world, the scandals, uh, the entertainment that the world, that society finds intriguing. News headlines often reveal tragedy, reveals pride and selfishness and greed. The FDIC this last week made headlines Maybe you saw some of those. Wall Street Journal published a couple different articles revealing allegations of a toxic workplace culture at that particular federal um, agency. Um, drove many female uh, bank examiners to quit. It included strip clubs, alcohol in the office, and nude photos all made the list in this, this revelation uh, coming out of the FDIC. Past employees describe working at the FDIC as a, quote, sexualized boys club environment, end quote. Uh, and yet this has gone on. We're, we're learning for a, for, for a long time, for decades. Hollywood is typically at the center of shifting cultural norms. And maybe you saw here within the last week or so that their strike is over. Uh, the writers had gone on a very prolonged strike, the screenwriters. And so it seems that movies should be coming back around to sort of their, their normal release patterns soon. Movies that are filled with violence and social agendas, sexual immorality and filth. These are, this is what's in the lineup. There was a teacher at Georgia Southern University. He made this statement. He wrote, quote, because of the popularity of action and horror movies, we end up seeing these sad stories and horrible acts as entertainment. By watching these movies, 
it tends to normalize violence in our minds, especially the idea of revenge, end quote. And so this is the world we live in, isn't it? And we have to be mindful of what we're watching. And sometimes we watch something that seems harmless. So then all of a sudden something sneaks in and your eyes get big and you look at the friend or your spouse next to you and well, where did that come from, right? I didn't see that twist coming. Many of the songs on the radio aren't really much better. Not a whole lot of violence in song lyrics, but such immorality is certainly high. And it's not just the pop songs, right? It's the good old country songs as well that we have to be careful of. Sexual overtones and innuendos uh, end up becoming sort of a catchy, poetic uh, tune. Considering our fragile state as humans, like the egg, how do we protect ourselves from the influence of a spiritual being whose goal it is to try to devour us? Not snack or nibble, but to consume us. Today I want to begin, I don't know how many parts, at least a two-part sermon series, and simply ask, are you becoming desensitized? Are you becoming desensitized to your environment? Or are you actively on guard? Are you actively on guard? Are you becoming desensitized, or are you actively on guard? Passover is surprisingly just a number of months away. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and Last Great Day has passed. Passover and Unleavened Bread will be coming up in the, the middle part of April uh, this next year. Uh, so we're just a little over five months away, and that time will go very quickly. This is the time of year to mend our fences. You might recall a sermon that Mr. Shaby gave, I believe it was last winter, uh, about how the winter time is good for sort of taking stock, right? Mending those fences, so to speak. Fixing the tools, sharpening them for the next growing season. Making repairs. Spiritually, it's a great time to consider where we are and where we're going and things that we need to be aware of in order to, to watch out for in the coming year. If you think forward to next April, when we'll be talking a lot about uh, Israel and uh, them coming out of Egypt. Egypt, we know, is a biblical metaphor for sin. It's a biblical uh, metaphor for, for slavery. The Israelites could not worship and obey God in that particular environment. God needed to pull them out. He wanted them to leave that environment, that nation. But unfortunately, after they were miraculously delivered from Egypt, they failed to put the sin behind them. They failed to, to leave off the influences of, of Egypt. Failed to move them on from their lives. Maybe you've hold, heard the old saying, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. And I think maybe there was a little bit of ancient Israel and Egypt in that saying as well. Although the Israelites were delivered geographically from Egypt, um, with the notable exceptions of a few individuals, they, they never really overcame the, the effects of their environment. And they always struggled with getting rid of the sin and permanently moving it on. Are we sometimes like the Israelites? You and I have access to God's Holy Spirit. We understand His plan of salvation. But are we allowing ourselves to be blended with some percentage of the society around us? Ancient Israel was. They, they brought even some of the Egyptian gods with them. It didn't take long for some of them to pop up. But those, those things were always with the, the Israelites. They, they were always popping up in various ways. And Israel was always trying to, to turn to them at certain times. The question for you and me today is, are we really coming out of our own Egypts? Are we really coming out, or is it just a nice, catchy slogan? Is it something that we talk about as we approach Passover and Unleavened Bread, and how we need to come out? Are we truly coming out, or 
have we become desensitized to the world around us? And maybe it's hard to differentiate a little bit about what is good and what is evil. Let's go back just a little bit here to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes to the church at Corinth in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank to that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Notice verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted and don't become idolaters as some of them were. Verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And one day a lot of people fell. Verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. But notice verse 11. Now, all these things happen to them as examples. Right, we have several things that are listed here in verses 6 and 7 and 8, uh, 9. Right, these things happen to them. And their response is recorded for us as an example, verse 11. This is the Greek word that means for admonition or warning. Right, so these things are recorded not to put a black mark on them, right? not to have some sort of character assassination sort of plot against these people that came out of Egypt. Right? But verse 11, they happened to them as examples, as a warning. And they were written for our admonition. The word admonition there, maybe your center margin uses the word instruction. They're, they're there for our, for our learning, right? For us to be instructed by what the Israelites uh, came up against and then what they, ha how they failed to follow God, right? These were temptations. If you go back to verse 6, these were things that, that they were trying to, to not absorb from the nations and the societies around them, and yet they, they let these things creep in. They brought Egypt with them, and, and they, they refused to put them off. And so these outside influences cause these issues that we see here in verses 6 and 7, 8, 9. Um, and, and Paul here recounts them, that they're for our, for our learning, for our instruction. Uh, continuing uh, the last part here, verse 11, upon whom... The, uh, the ends of the age, um, th upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Right? So it wasn't recorded for their understanding. It wasn't written for their knowledge so that they could learn from it. It was written for us, right? for us, to those who are seeing the end of the age, right? so that we can be aware of the society, be aware of the environment that's around us. Verse 12, therefore, remember the word therefore, we talk about this often, right? the word therefore means, okay, with everything that's been said above, take that and let's, let's move forward keeping those things in mind. So verse 12, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Right? This is recorded for us, instructions for us examples to us so that we can stand, so that we can be faithful to God, so that we can be resilient, so that we can appropriately accomplish that verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we can be alert, and we can see those dangers, and we can pray and ask God to help navigate us through this way of life, this, this society and culture that, that we have to live in, but that we shouldn't be a part of. These examples are there to help us navigate with God's help. One of the major lessons for us today is that overcoming the sinful environment that we live in is a major 
key to putting sin out of our lives. We have to overcome this environment. We're, we're in this environment, you might say, for a purpose. Right? Jesus Christ prayed to the Father, don't, don't take them out of the environment. Right? Protect them. That's to be our daily prayer. Right? Give us this day. Protect us from the evil one. Keep us on guard. Clear that path for us. To rephrase an earlier statement, you and I have not yet been delivered uh, from the environment around us, but God still expects it not to enslave us, right? He still expects us not to allow that environment to enslave us, right? We're in the environment. We're pummeled with ads and, and billboards and uh, storefronts and music and all of the stuff that, that Satan is pushing at society, right? It's all there. We, we haven't been delivered from that. We're not in some remote compound fenced off from all the world. This, is, this was not Jesus Christ's prayer. Oh, please protect that piece of property in Wyoming that all of your people can go to, <laughs> right? We're, we're still here, but God expects us to be on on guard to be alert and make sure that that doesn't ensnare us. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. Let's go forward just half a dozen pages or so. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What argument, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. God says, I'll dwell in them. I'll walk among them, right? This is God's desire. This is God's purpose for us. He wants to dwell in us. He wants to walk among us. He wants to be our God and he wants us to be his people. Verse 17, therefore come out from among them. Right? He tells us his desire. Verse 16, this is his desire. Right? You have to be in the world. You have, to, you have to, to, to go these places. You have to work with these people. You have to sit in schools and colleges next to these people. You have to, you have to be in this. Right? But God says, be careful not to let it ensnare you. Right? Don't, don't let that rub off on you and, and cause you to live a life different than what the Bible says. And so he tells us, verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Right? This is the difficulty that we're addressing here in the sermon. Right? How do we live in? How do we shop? How do we school? How do we work? How do we earn money? How do we take care of our families and yet be separate? Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, you know, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Notice we can't have both. Right? We can't go off and, and do all these things that society is sort of pressuring us to do and become and be, and yet somehow say, mm, I, I want this over here as well. Right? I, I want God's blessings of verse 18, but I only want to partially be separate. Or, or even worse, I want to sort of put these blinders on and, and become desensitized to the point that I don't really think it's that bad. Right? The, the movie's not that bad. The words aren't that bad. Right? This way of life isn't that bad what these co-workers are doing and what I'm seeing on TV and the news, it's not that bad. And so the admonishment for us is to be careful that we don't become desensitized to where that line sort of gets wavy and blurred. In verse 17, the word come out, there literally means to depart from someone's presence. Right? To depart from someone's presence. And that's sometimes hard for us to do, right? No, I, 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 I'm not going to go hang out with you. I'm not going to come over for dinner. I'm going to turn that TV off. I'm going to change the channel. I'm going to turn the radio off. Right? I'm not going to read that news story. Right? 
this is sort of where the rubber meets the road. The word come out literally means to depart from someone's presence. When I was a kid, I've mentioned this before, my, my love, in quotation marks, for peas. I, I, I appreciate those of you who grow peas throughout the, the growing seasons and you like them and all that. That's, that's nice, and I'm glad you like them. But as a kid, nothing could touch the peas. When my mom had that dreadful day when she would serve peas for dinner that night, those days were dreadful to me. Nothing could touch the peas because the yuckiness of the peas would often rub off on the other foods, and then the whole plate was, was a wash. Um, those other food items to me would become unclean, <laughs> right? Um, I sort of tolerate shepherd's pie even to today. I don't understand why, but um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to become more flexible. Um, but, but here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, God tells us to be separate. Right? And the Greek word that Paul uses here literally means to be separate. There, there's, there's nothing ambiguous about that. Paul uses a word that's translated in our English language that literally means what it says, right? To be separate. We're to have no dealings there. Cleansing is necessary as we're involved with the world and their norms become our norms. And that's the caution for us, isn't it? As society sort of accepts different things, our challenge is not to sort of accept them as well. I've described below, or uh, I've described before sort of this this line that, that the world at large and specifically our society is in, where it's sort of on this downward trend. The caution for us is not to say, well, I just need to stay above that downward trend, right? Because if we, if we say that, if we take that approach, then we're also on a downward trend, aren't we? We're just maybe a little bit better than, than everyone else. God has a standard. His standard is consistent, and that's the line that you and I should be holding and so we have to be careful not to get involved with the world and let those things come in to the point that we become desensitized. And we think, okay, I just need to stay above where the world is. Right? That, desensitiz that desensitization is, in, is important for us to, to keep in mind. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52 Isaiah 52, and notice verse 11. Uh, Isaiah 52, verse 11. The prophet writes, Depart, depart, get out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. It's my belief that to the extent to which we don't participate in this societies is the extent to which we're close to God. And, and Isaiah is sort of bringing this out. Paul brings this out to the church at, at Corinth. To the extent that we don't participate in the world's affairs is the extent to which we're, we're close to God. And God is talking through Isaiah here, telling his people to, to, to depart right? Leave those things. Touch nothing that's unclean. Get out from the midst of her. We can get all enraptured with the latest movie or this, this hit song that's on the radio. But, but is it right? Is it really what we should be engaging our life in? Or are we contradicting what Isaiah writes here in verse 11? We can't sort of dangle our toes in the pools of this world and yet expect to stay dry, right? We're either dangling the toes or we're dry. We, we can't sort of have it both ways. Notice verse 4. Let's back up here to verse 4. For thus says the Lord God, right? So this isn't just Isaiah writing. We, we know that Isaiah is writing under inspiration, but he's, he's quoting God, right? God is writing through Isaiah, right? This is what God says. And 
he talks about being separate and coming out and coming before him. And so we come down to verse 11, and he repeats this statement twice, right? It's not just, hey, d- depart. No, it's, it's a double depart. <laughs> depart, depart, right? There's this exclamation. Get out from there. And notice that's even repeated. Right? Get out from there. Get out from there in the midst of her, right? Go out. Right? We have this double reinforcement from, from God himself. And notice the audience here at the, in the verse 11, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Right? Do you bear the vessels of the Lord? Are you baptized? Have you committed to this way of life? Is God's spirit in you? Is God's spirit working with you? If you're not baptized, do you, do you see God's calling in your life? Do you see the blessings for following his way of life? We here are bearing the vessels of the Lord. And there's, there's a difficulty that comes with that bearing, isn't there? It's a difficulty of turning things off and changing the station and closing the website. Right? We're, we're to come out from that. We're to depart from that because we bear something special to God. We, we bear the vessels of the Lord. Let's notice Romans. If you'll turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 and verse 1. While you're turning to Romans 12, I'll just drop a footnote that I'd love to do a Bible study sometime on Romans. I've been studying Romans off and on for more than a year, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to get into Romans and break the verses down and, and talk about some of these great concepts that, that Paul wrote, writes here to this largely Gentile city. But notice Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, right? Again, we have the audience. It's not, I beseech you therefore, society, the world at large, you know, this is not a message to Nineveh. Right? God's not having Paul write to Nineveh saying, okay, you're doing some really bad things. I need you to dial it down a little bit. Right? This is not what we read here. This is Paul writing to the church, to, to those that God is calling and working with. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, reasonable it is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that is what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god there's a lot of good things for us to mull on here but i want to draw your attention to the phrase at the beginning of verse two because this is the sermon topic for this week Right? Do not be conformed to this world. That's the hard thing to do, isn't it? That's the hard one. Because society under Satan's influence is all about desensitizing. Desensitizing the whole lot of humanity. And if we're not careful, we can get caught up in that. And we can get into the mindset of, oh, I just need to stay above society. Right? I just need to keep this distance above society as it, as it dwindles off. Verse 2, the command here by the Apostle Paul is not to be conformed, right? Satan wants to desensitize us. He wants to wear us down slowly. He's in this, this marketing campaign that's sometimes referred to as, as a drip campaign, right? It's a little bit here. It's a little bit there. 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 It's a, it's a technique used by marketers, Right? Hey, there's this billboard. Hey, there's this. Hey, I'm going to put a door hanger on. Hey, there's this advertisement. Oh, I think I need a new roof. Who should I call? Oh, there's that company that I've seen all these years. It's, it's a drip campaign. And oftentimes, this is Satan's motives, right? It's, it's this slow campaign to sort of wear us down. The slow conforming, right? Satan's not after the... One day we're with God, one day we're rejecting him and abhorring God's spirit and walking away. Satan would be okay with that, but, but he's in it for the long game, right? If he can wear us down, if he can get us to sort of conform a little bit today, 
and another little bit next week, and a little bit the week after that. Right now, we're becoming desensitized to this evil environment that's around us, this environment that is sinful and lawless. So are we becoming desensitized to the evil around us? We can answer and say, no, of course not. Of course not. The society that we live in, though, has a fascination with death, with wizards, with magic, with spirits, with vampires, games of shooting. Right? Not always shooting people because... This game that I like to play, we shoot monsters and aliens, and so that's different. And we, can say we, we can say we compartmentalize, but we really don't do that very well as humans. We, we, we say that we can put this in a bucket, and we can maul in there, then we can put the lid on and go about our life. But the reality is, is we, we struggle with that. It's just an excuse. We can say we compartmentalize, I can watch this movie and I can put it in this bucket and it doesn't affect me. But the reality is, is it does. It does. It does have a real effect on us. When we desensitize ourselves, there's a certain level of, of acceptance that comes with it. I want you to remember that for a minute. When we desensitize ourselves, there's a certain level of acceptance that comes with it. Keep that in mind. Let's go back just a few chapters to chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to simple passions. <laughs> ah, it says vile passions, right? For this reason, God gave them up to vile pass passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use uh, for what is against nature. This is, where this is where society is headed. This society that you and I have to be a part of in order to live and function and work and glean an education and, and sort of manage, but yet a society that we're not to be um, uh, conforming to. Right? This is the world we live in. God gave them up to vile passions. And there's verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Right? This is our entertainment industry, isn't it? Uh, this is the way humanity thinks. And it's not just our century or the last couple of centuries. We can see evidence of this throughout all of mankind's history. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This sums up country music. This sums up pop music. This sums up <laughs> movies that we watch. Right? Things that we're, we, we, we sort of are aware of in our work environments, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. Right? This is the world we live in. And yet we have to be careful not to become desensitized to this to say well it's not that vile right yeah the they shot the person but at least they didn't cut his head off right I, we have to be careful about not being desensitized and saying well it's it's at least they didn't go this far right at least they only slept with the one person right again my earlier statement when we desensitize ourselves there's a certain level of acceptance and Paul here is writing to the church, and he's like, stay away from this. Right? This is not what God has called you to. Again, consider that your mind is like an egg. It's amazing. It's resilient. 
It's an amazing creation, but yet it's also impressionable. It, it needs to grow. And God tells us time and time again in Scripture to be aware of what's going on around us, to be separate, protect the character that he's building in each of us, to protect that covenant of marriage that, that, that we said yes to at, at baptism, that, that engagement, that, that betrothal, protect the relationships, protect the images and the dreams that, that result from what our eyes see by subjecting ourselves to society's pleasures, we grant a certain level of acceptance to those things. And that is the hard thing. That's the hard thing for us to do. It's ungodly to kill another human. It's ungodly to have saved gender relationships. It's ungodly to be sexual promiscuous. It's ungodly to have a family unit structured like that which we see on TV and in movies. Yet this is the world around us. This is the world that you and I live in. Uh, it wasn't quite to the degree when my grandparents were alive and their parents before them. They had their own, their own issues. My, my dad would tell stories of them growing up and things that went on in this small little no traffic light little town called Riley out in the, the, the country, out in uh, western Ohio, southwestern Ohio. They had their challenges too. They had their things to watch out for. This is the world around us though. Desensitization can and will occur if we don't guard against it, if we're not aware of it. Let's go back to the book of John. John chapter 17. John 17, we know of uh, it's familiar to us as it's um, one of Christ's last prayers that's recorded for us. So he's praying to his father and breaking into the middle of the prayer here in verse 11. He says, I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. And so he acknowledges that there's a physical world that he's about to leave but God's people would remain in. Right? He's not saying, okay, I'm, I'm departing, and thankfully they're all coming with me. <laughs> this is not what he's saying. I'm no longer in the world, but, but, but these people are. These people that, that you're calling, they, they are. Verse 14, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. You and I work very diligently to be, to, to be committed to God, to stand up for his truth, to stand up for what's right. And sometimes we get teased. Oh, there's that person. <laughs> uh, better not tell that joke around so-and-so. They're not going to be happy with you, right? There's sort of this, this teasing, this razzing that sometimes goes on from the world to us. Verse 15, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. This ties back with where we started back in 1 Peter 5. Right? We're, we're to be sober, we're to be vigilant, we're to be aware of these things. Right? Ooh, that movie's coming out and no thank you. Right? Ooh, this is no thank you. Oh, I see. Nope, no thank you. Keep them from the evil one. Protect them, Jesus Christ prays. Help, help make that road. Help show them how to navigate this, this world, this evil. Help them navigate Satan's ploys and his sneaking around and hiding behind trees, waiting to, to pounce. Verse 16, they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Notice the confidence here. Right? Jesus Christ is praying in advance that, that you would be strong, right? that, that you and I would, would be sober and vigilant. Right? This to me is a very encouraging statement that he makes in verse 16. He's emphatic. They are not of the world. Right? Those that you call, those that you call Father, 
they're not of the world, right? They have accepted this way of life, right? and they have come out. Right? He's, he's confident in your actions. He's confident in my actions that, that we will apply, that we will apply the entire word of God, that we will be mindful to what God has called us to, and we'll separate ourselves, that, that we'll be mindful that Satan doesn't slowly creep in through this process of desensitizing us to, to what's going on. He's confident. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Unlike the ancient Israelites, you and I are not removed from our environment. Our challenge is how to live and function in the environment without becoming desensitized and allowing sort of this silent acceptance of this degrading world that we live in. The United Church of God, several years ago, had um, a publication called The Vertical Thought, and it was a, a great publication. Uh, it wrote primarily to the youth of the church. There was one issue where they, they made this statement uh, in relation to the, the topic here today. The Vertical Thought magazine writes, Satan has made it almost impossible to remain pure in this world. He has given us the illusion that sex equals love, that everything we see in the movies, all the hype that surrounds sex is true. The constant barrage of pornography in our world today is often too enticing for curious boys and girls. These images demean sex and desensitize watchers to the real effects of premarital sex. End quote. This is our world. Right? We, we acknowledge this in the church. It's a dangerous place. Right? Satan makes it super easy for us to say, eh, a little bit is okay. A 2007 study out of Iowa State University, uh, they did a study of video game players. They found that even brief exposure to violent media had a measurable desensitizing effect. The authors of the study expressed the con um, concerns regarding the way popular media is presented to the public uh, over a lifespan. The study makes the statement, quote, children receive high doses of media violence and initially is packaged in ways that are not too threatening with cute cartoon-like characters, a total absence of blood and gore and other features that make the overall experience a pleasant one arousing a positive emotion, emotional reaction uh, that are incongruent with normal native reactions to violence. Uh, think back to some of the childhood cartoons, right? Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner, right? There's incredible violence there, but it's sort of fun and lighthearted, right? So this is, this is where this study is, is going. It starts off with that. The quote continues, Older children then consume increasingly threatening and realistic violence, but the increases are gradual and always in a way that is fun. In short, the modern entertainment media landscape could accurately be described as an effective, systematic violence desensitization tool, end quote. This is our world. Right? This is the world we all grew up with. Right? Anybody love Tom and Jerry as a kid as much as I did? right? Poor Tom, right? And the cartoons I did not like is where Tom got the upper hand on Jerry, right? I defended Jerry, right? Jerry was my pal, and when Tom got the upper hand, I did not like that episode. Right. Let's go back to, the, to Isaiah. Maybe I'm still a little bitter. I don't know about those episodes. Poor Jerry. Isaiah 5, Isaiah 5 and verse 20, it's a, a great memory verse that many of us know. Isaiah 5 and verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, right? who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is this is the trend that we have to be careful of. Are we slowly moving from, from good is actually evil? If we read the headlines, they're filled with sex scandals, people denying any sort of wrongdoing. 
There's a bombing here. There's dozens that die over there. Enhancement surgeries. No one cares about finances. What do you mean the debt ceiling? Even Ouija boards sometimes are sold at, uh, or in the recent past, were sold at a national toy chain for $22.99. Are we becoming desensitized? Are we becoming desensitized to the world that we live in? The next sermon, which here in Tulsa will be in two weeks, I want to look at countering this environment. I want to look at how we can counter this influence, this this incredible effort that Satan is putting into desensitizing us. How how, how do we counter that? The Bible lays out real steps that that we can use and put into place on a daily basis to, to stop that desensitization and to be on guard for Satan's sort of slowly lurking and trying to dribble into our life. Before that sermon, though, you have homework. And I know it's been a long time, so I'll give you a minute to let it settle in, but I have homework for you. And I, I would like you to, to take an honest look at the homework. I want you to look at, I want you to take a, an examination of your life and this environment that we all live. Right? Consider your life, whether you're retired, whether you work, whether you're in school, whether you're a parent, whether you're a grandparent, all of us can take a look at the life and, and our involvement within the society around us. To whatever degree you and I are desensitized, I want you to look around and note the sly ways that Satan is causing humans to, 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 to look at Isaiah 5 and verse 20, this, this slow transition between good is evil. I want you to, to, to take note of that life Take note of the songs that you listen to. Take note of what Amazon videos that clicker lands on. Right? Take note of the books maybe you read at night to wind down before you go to sleep. Right? Just take an objective look. You don't necessarily need to do anything. That's, that's for the next sermon. We'll talk through scriptures in the next sermon. But in preparation for that, I want you just to take an objective look. I know for me, I'm not going to like what I, what I find, right? Because I have my Spotify playlists, and I have these things and that, and I have my routines, and I have a feeling a lot of that should need to be reworked. Right? But I want you just to take an objective look about where you go and why you do it and the things you buy and the things you listen to and the things you watch and read and the people you talk to around the water cooler and what those conversations consist of. Right? Just... Just take a look at that environment. Take a look at the, the involvement that you have in that environment. Just, if you're still here in Isaiah, let's go forward to chapter 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, and let's read verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah here points out the change is needed. But again, the very beautiful part of this verse is that change is possible, right? Okay, so maybe in the coming week or two, you'll find some things that, yeah, maybe there is a little bit of desensitization that's been going on in my life. I want you to remember Isaiah 55 and verse 7. This exercise is not meant to be a whipping tool for us, right? Oh, yeah, I'm really bad. and Oh, I've let so much in. Oh, I'm such a bad person. No, think about Isaiah 55 and verse 7. Right? First, we have to be aware. We can't change that from which we're not aware. Right? So, the, so step one is asking God to, to show us these things. Show us these areas of our life that, that we have allowed some of this society to creep in. Right? Let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts. There has to be an awareness first. The middle part, let him return to the Lord. 
Like, this is the exciting part. Like, God wants to help us. He wants us, he wants to help us navigate this life in order to be aware that Satan is there and there and there and all around and he wants to devour us. But, oh, look, here's, here's this path to my feet. This is the way I should be going. And then the beauty of the last part of verse 7 here, he will have mercy on him and he will abundantly pardon We're not too far down this road that we can't can't make a change. Verse 8, for my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts uh, than your thoughts. So let's ask, can this apply to me? Are my thoughts the same as God's thoughts? Well, the next couple weeks will tell, won't it? Would God sing along to that song with you in the car? (laughs) Would God join you in the theater as you watch that movie? Some of the short videos on YouTube shorts or Instagram reels, would he laugh at the same things? I don't know. Likely not, but that's for the next couple weeks to reveal, isn't it? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10 and verse 4. We'll read verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Right? Satan has worked this magnificent um, wand, you might say, over society to desensitize it. And to think, okay, well, that's not as bad as it was five years ago. I remember what it was like five years ago, and it's not, it's not as bad as then. Right? We, we say these statements there, there's a little bit here, isn't there? It's a little bit for us to be on guard for. Society today is not as, a, not as bad as it was when I was a kid. Verse 4. Now the weapons of, uh, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of of Christ. Right? Change is possible. We can change. God wants us to change. God wants us to be aware so that we can change. So in conclusion here this morning, we need to realize that Satan wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy us as a church, as a body. He wants to destroy us from doing a work, uh, that magnificent work that God is, is doing inside each of us to change our, our hearts and our minds. He wants to prevent us from accomplishing the purpose that God has created us for and called us to. And if he's able to any various degree at doing those things, then he's able to undermine our faith. Satan wants to wear us down. He wants to make us weary. He wants to tire us out. And he's willing to do it a little bit at a time. Next week's headlines will be just a little bit worse than this week's headlines. Next year's movie releases will be just a little bit worse than they were this year. You and I need to stand strong on our knees. And if we're going to be strong, then it's through praying, it's through fasting, it's through staying close to God. It's going to require us to be mindful of the evil that's around us, the society that's around us, and avoiding it at all costs. Let's go back for a final verse to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 may be a familiar verse to you once we start reading it. It may sound familiar. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God can know it, and with God's spirit and with God's involvement in our life, we can get a glimpse into who we are and the things we need to change. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God wants to help us. He wants us to overcome. He's there for us. Jesus Christ is our biggest champion. 
He's, he's there pulling for our success. And as we ask, he's giving us tools and resources to, to help us. Notice verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Right? Save me and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. You and I need to be separate from Satan's world, but with God's help, still function in it. Let's be conscious of the difficulty in this balance. It is a difficult balance. Let's pray and ask God for insight and wisdom and awareness of the evil that is so prevalent in society today. Right? Lawlessness that's so prevalent. Let's be mindful of the allures of this world and build an awareness to being desensitized to its evil.